Welcome everybody. It's going to be a great class today. We're really excited to go over canonical and landmark Supreme Court cases. Canonical is like our SAT word of today and landmark Supreme Court cases basically mean the same thing, but these are really big cases that have made history and are so relevant to both the time period and today. So here's the big idea of today. The Supreme Court has been at the center of some of the most important constitutional debates in American history. And over time, the court's landmark decisions have shaped constitutional law across a range of areas. Areas that include the powers of the government, areas that include the meaning of the Constitution's promise of freedom and equality, and the balance of power between the national and state governments. We were talking about that in our pre-show timing. So why do we study landmark cases? We study to understand how the judicial branch works, and that's the Supreme Court behind me. And we look at the judicial decisions of the past and how they affect the law. We also do it to see how past court cases have affected your everyday life and your individual rights. And also to help us predict the future. You know, how have the cases been playing out and how does it, how will they help us understand what the court may do next? So there's a lot of reasons we study these landmark cases, and we have a lot of those cases to go through today. So I'm your guide, Curry Sautner, the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'm here with one of our top scholars, Nicholas Mazvek. Nicholas, would you like to say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody, and uh, I won't take any more time because Curry is right. We have a lot to get through, as usual. <laughs> so I think theme, we try to group these into themes, yes. and theme number one is Supreme Court Foundations. So Nicholas, when you think Supreme Court Foundations, what's the court case that pops into your head? So we're thinking of the Marshall Court because we're really thinking of, uh, so we'd like to remind people, John Marshall is actually not the first or the second or even the third Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. We went through three of them um, in just over the first decade of the uh, government's existence under the Constitution. Uh, John Marshall is the fourth, but then John Marshall is on the court for over three decades, and we tend to think of it as the most important period of time in the court's history because it's really when Marshall and the court establish what we now accept and think of as the powers and duty of the Supreme Court. And that's what I think we mean by that foundation, right? So what are the two big cases? Well, the big one uh, the first big one is Marbury versus Madison. So we see all the characters here. That's a remind you of there's an election that happens that's kind of important that sets up this case. That's the election of 1800. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams are running against each other again, the former friends and later friends again, or as Curry calls them, frenemies. All fair ways of describing them. It's a very contentious election. Um, at that time, there is a, uh, there's months of delay between the old and the new president. Uh, so John Adams and the Federalists are still in power. They pass um, new judgeships. These are called the Midnight Judge Appointments. That's what they call them uh, in a Judiciary Act that sets up these new courts. And uh, commissions are supposed to go out for those new officers. That includes what are called Justices of the Peace. Uh, in Washington, D.C. John Marbury is a Federalist. He is one of the Federalists who is given a commission to be a Justice of the Peace. However, his commission is not delivered. So John Marshall, he was a Secretary of State. Suddenly, he's also Chief Justice. He's now been appointed to that position. Uh, Mr. Marshall's a little overwhelmed. He doesn't deliver all the commissions. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's administration is now in. James Madison's the new Secretary of State. He shows up. There are some commissions in his desk. Jefferson tells them, don't send those out. John Marbury sues. What does he want? He wants that commission and he wants the court to give it to him. That's the summary of the facts. Supreme Court and John Marshall say no. Why do they say no? Well, they say, look, uh, Marbury, you do have a right to your commission. You should have gotten it. So in other words, that job you wanted that you were given, you should have gotten it. Um, so uh, Madison should have delivered that commission. Uh, so you have a right to it. However, the court can't give it to you. What, and what's really crucial here is the reason why he said the court couldn't order that uh, the commission be given to him 
is because the power that was granted to them to do so was based on the first Judiciary Act of 1789. And Marshall said that section of that act was unconstitutional. So in order for Marshall to say that, he had to explain that the Supreme Court had the power to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. And he had to explain why they had that power and why it was the duty of the Supreme Court to make that consideration. So that's the key, right? Is Curry's telling you in the chat, that's judicial review. Um, so that's what this case is about. This is about judicial review and how Marshall gets to it, right? He takes this crazy set of facts and he does this little magic trick here, right? Which is, yes, you deserve this, but you can't get it. Here's why. And all of this is to say that's judicial review. It's how we get that. So I think that's like our quick little summary of Marbury. It's very important. So we want to say enough about it. But we do want to say something about McCullough too, which is the second of what we're calling these foundational, these early foundational cases of the Marshall era. And McCulloch, um, why is this so important? Well, it relates to its own early debate. So Marbury is about that debate about the Supreme Court's role, what judicial review is, um, whether or not the Supreme Court has a special um, or unique role in deciding whether or not actions of the government are constitutional. McCulloch is about uh, the National Bank, which is one of the first uh, key constitutional debates in the Republic's history. In 1791, Alexander Hamilton, who was then Treasury Secretary, introduces his financial plan. Part of that is to set up a national bank uh, in order to deal with the debts of the country. And it's uh, James Madison and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson who uh, lead the opposition and say, this is unconstitutional. This exceeds the powers of Congress. There's nothing in Article 1 that suggests that there's a power to establish a bank. Um, and so that's, that's a key debate in 1791. Many years later, 1819, that's almost 30 years later, this comes up to the Supreme Court. It gets there because Maryland essentially tries to tax the Bank of the United States. There's a second bank. So Madison himself as president actually signs the rechartering. Rechartering just means that they extend the life of the bank basically, right? The bank is only chartered or created for a certain period of time. It was extended. Maryland didn't like this. The way they tried to oppose it was to tax the bank. And Marshall says, you can't do that. States don't have that kind of power. They can't interfere with the uh, proper powers of Congress, right? Congress has unique, specific powers over certain objects that states cannot interfere with. Part of that is the supremacy clause, right? But uh, essentially, Marshall is saying uh, this is uh, these are powers granted to Congress, and part of the reason they have them is um, they have their choice of means. What I mean by that is. Congress is granted powers, and it's not limited just specifically to that, uh, the limits of that text themselves. Congress also gets to decide how they carry out those powers, right? So in other words, there are um, additional powers in some sense, right? Because Congress has to be able to choose how to carry those out. Congress has given all these obligations in Article 1, Section 8, coining of money, commerce clause, all these things. In order to carry that out, if their choice is to create a national bank to do so, they are allowed to do that, essentially, right? So, Got it. So these foundational cases set up the almost like the key job of the Supreme Court in the first case. And in the second case, the supremacy of the laws and that there's some flexibility in the way that it's written. It's not just yeah. perfectly spelled out. And Got I it. just so realized I forgot the one key part, which is the necessary and proper clause. We should mention that point is that these are appropriate choices by Congress. They're allowed to expand in some respect those powers granted to them when they choose the means by how to carry them out, so long as they're appropriate. Got it. So that falls under Congress's role to set up laws yes. that are necessary and proper. Got it. Yes. So lots of these like constitutional words coming at you, but think about it like this early court takes Article 3 of the Constitution and defines it by their actions. So that's why these are landmark cases because they start to spell out the job of the Supreme Court but through these cases. And that's fascinating. And the Supreme Court says, hey, we interpret the law. 
where the, the law is then supreme. And then there's jobs of other other branches and they can be spelled out by their actions too. So and really a reminder, Curry, to just say quickly that you just remember at the beginning of the country in these early years, we wrote a constitution, but a lot of what we're talking about is the different branches figuring out what it means. They do have to figure out what it means, right? They have to, the word we use is they have to expound the constitution, but that just means they have to figure out what it means. We debated, we, wrote this text, we ratified it. Yeah, we have to figure it out, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, they're, and they're, you know, adults like to say they're flying the plane as they build it. <laughs> <That's kind laughs> yes. <what> they're doing. <laughs> something, okay, so, something like that. <laughs> so next number part. <laughs> two has a lot of cases in it. And yes. I'll just read a couple of names to you guys right now. So the case theme of this next grouping is Constitution's Promise of Equality. So Dred Scott is in here. Plessy V. Ferguson is in here. Uh, Brown versus Board of Ed, as well as Regents of University of California v. Bake. Bake. Am I saying that right? Baki. Thank you. I was like, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> like it comes out of your mouth and you know it's not right. So there are some four <laughs> cases. We can't really go through all of them. So, and we can lightly touch them. But um, Nick, what's kind of the, do you want to start with Scott or do you really want to dive into Plessy or Brown? Yeah, I mean, I think those three can kind of be taken together as one sort of large, I mean, we're talking about nearly a century of time there in terms of uh, the beginning to the end, right? Dred Scott setting out um, through Chief Justice Roger Taney this notion that uh, Black Americans could not be citizens of the United States and therefore um, they could not make certain claims. They couldn't sue in federal court for their freedom. Um, that's a big part of the outcome of Dred Scott. I mean, the other part has to do with Congress's power to ban slavery in the territories. Uh, but certainly the citizenship is important because uh, as we often talk about, part of what happens with the 13th Amendment with end slavery by constitutional amendment after the Emancipation Proclamation is that that moves, starts to move against Dred Scott. And the 14th Amendment seals that by creating a um, uh, birthright citizenship, right, which reverses Dred Scott in a status of citizenship for all those born within United States territory. So Kerry just answered that question. You're looking at that picture of Dred and Harriet Scott. So when I said the suit for freedom, that's what they did. They sued for their freedom. Um, in 1846, it took 11 years to get to the Supreme Court. There are many reasons for that, but these are called freedom suits. And Dred Scott is ruling that because they weren't, couldn't be citizens, um, at least according to the majority of the court, we always like to remember there were two dissenters. Um, and as I like to note, one of them even quit the court over this case, which is an amazing thing, um, but uh, that they couldn't sue in the first place. Um, and then what is Plessy? That's almost 40 years later, that's 1896. What is Plessy getting at? So we've had these new amendments that I just referred to, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment, the Reconstruction Amendments, which are supposed to broadly guarantee the rights and freedoms of the newly freed African-Americans. So how does Plessy push back against this or reverse this in some respects? We're talking about- Plessy, just because we always like them. Yes, the Homer Plessy is, um, he's a young man in uh, Louisiana and he is part of, I, I believe, the Colored Commission, something like that. They, they have a, I, I can't remember the exact name at, right off the top of my head, but they, they have a group of citizens, essentially, who are trying to oppose these new Jim Crow laws. And Homer Plessy is, I think, an eighth African-American, something like that. So he's mixed race, and he looks white. And so he volunteers to be the person to get arrested. They, they create what's called a test case. Essentially, they know the person who's gonna arrest Mr. Plessy. Um, he's part of the scheme. They're setting this up in order to test the constitutionality of the law. And their idea is Plessy doesn't even look, he looks white. So if he's arrested under this separate cars act, meaning there's a black car and a white car essentially, it will prove that it's all arbitrary, right? There's no real principle at hand here. Um, and therefore that's a problem, right? So that's how they set up the challenge to this law. And Plessy is arguing both that the law is arbitrary um, in that it violates equal protection of uh, under the 14th Amendment, right? Uh, as well as the 13th Amendment, he has other arguments too, 
But that's that's kind of the core, right? Is the equality argument. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, seven to one says no. They say um, no. Jim Crow laws are acceptable, and it's. I always think one of the more amazing facts about it is it's written by um, Justice Brown, who's from Massachusetts. We'll get to the the man who dissents is from Connecticut uh, for, from Kentucky. That's Justice Harlan. Uh, but Brown says. Um, uh, separate but equal is okay because the 13th and 14th Amendment were only guaranteeing basic legal equality, uh, but they didn't mean to abolish distinctions based on color, um, especially social distinctions opposed to political equality. Uh, so in other words, states could use the police power, which is just the power of the states to regulate the health, morals, and safety of their people um, in order to enforce this social differences between the races, essentially. Uh, as I noted, Justice Harlan, John Harlan, who actually came from a slave-owning family and, in fact, opposed the 13th and 14th Amendments as a politician, he's the lone dissenter. He's changed his mind by this point. And he makes two crucial points we should mention, which is, one, he says uh, the court is wrong in how they're looking at this law. They're treating as, as these distinctions are neutral. Um, and he says, no, we know what's really going on here. This isn't about accommodating the races in, in a way in which they would choose to be separate. This is about enforcing distinctions between them, essentially a caste system. And he says that's obviously wrong under these amendments, and it's obviously unconstitutional. Um, and he says, quote, in the eye of the law, there is in this country, no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. Um, and so that idea, um, it takes a very long time to win out. But eventually, Brown is the victory of Harlan's view of the constitution. He's the lone dissenter, but nearly 60 years later, he wins out in Brown versus Board, with his, which is a unanimous decision. Uh, that means nine to zero. That's key because uh, the case actually came before the court two years before, and they have what's called a conference vote, meaning they kind of shared where they thought they were going to come out. And it was five to four the other way. Uh, Chief mm -hmm. Justice Vincent died of a heart attack in uh, September of 1953, uh, Earl Warren replaced him as chief justice and Warren uh, uh, deeply supported uh, the case against uh, separate but equal in um, primary school education. And so he looked to convince his colleagues that this needed to be unanimous. He thought that this, the Supreme Court needed to make a very strong statement uh, a very short statement against um, the inequality of the system and overruling Plessy because some of the judges, justices had questions about overruling a prior decision of the court. They may have disagreed with it, but they worried about disturbing precedent as they call it. Um, so they, they were reluctant to do so. Uh, they worried about disturbing state powers. They weren't really sure. They were nervous about this, but Warren convinced them uh, that they all needed to speak in one voice, the way John Marshall believed as well. And so that's what they did, um, which infamously surprised uh, the advocate before the court, Thurgood Marshall, who was representing the NAACP, who, as I like to note, had a strategy of decades of chipping piece by piece against this Jim Crow regime. And Brown is the crown jewel, so to speak, in that legal strategy that eventually took apart the Plessy decision. Uh, so that hopefully that kind of gets the end of that uh, trifecta of cases that I think makes sense to group together in a short discussion. That's awesome uh, because we have like 11 minutes left. I'm yes. going to jump us to areas where, you know, the introductory level is really important for our students. So the let's fundamental the, rights. <laughs> uh, I think I was going to jump to what do you want to do? Bill sure, rights. sure. Bill of yeah. rights is fine. And um, as we look at Bill of Rights, um, do you want to kick off with, um, um, let me see, which one is your favorite? Uh, Barnett's my want... favorite. I mean, we oh, should me go to too. Okay, good. Let's do Barnett. Shank, we, we can all agree, Shank versus the United States, everyone likes to talk about it. 
it's not as interesting of a case because Barnett also wants to talk about Joe Bidas. And yeah, let's exactly. talk about the role Jehovah's Witnesses played in establishing what we now all accept is kind of the core idea of religious freedom and freedom of speech and thought and conscience in this country. Um, I think there's, there's an incredible story to be told there uh, behind uh, the Barnett case. And basically what... The summary... and one thing real quick that I just sure, wanted sure. to add for everybody, students, you, you can see the years beside the cases and sometimes that's really important with Brown v. Board of Ed. If oh, you yes. look up the cases, you'll see 1952, 1954. So the one that Nick was just going through is the 1954 case. And that's why we always put the years on there because it really does, sometimes it can be named the same thing, but it'd be a different year. And that can get really confusing when you're looking it up and trying to find the right one. Um, so West Virginia v. Barnett, and I have a great image here and students pledge allegiance to the, saying the pledge of allegiance to the flag. And so saluting give us the flag. Story. And saluting yeah. the flag. So give us the story behind what's happening yeah. in America in the world in 1943. Yeah, so we're talking about in the middle of World War II. And so um, the whole story gets started before the United States enters. 1943, we're very much in the war. 1940 is the buildup, of course, to the United States eventually entering the war. At that point, it's just a European war. Um, but there is military buildup. There are changes happening in the country, even though the United States hasn't entered the war yet. Uh, 1940 is when the Joe Bidas decision comes down. Um, and there the Supreme Court says that primary schools can uh, coerce students into saluting the flag and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. In other words, they can force them to do so um, with threat of expulsion. Where do the Jehovah's Witnesses come into this? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, for those who don't know, um, they essentially believe that uh, no man-made law, no government can ever come before God's law. Um, they do that on the basis of um, Exodus and other um, biblical tenets. And so this in Nazi Germany, they were rather notably um, uh, gone after by the Nazis for their, uh, their, their refusal to salute the Nazi flag. Um, but in the United States, this became a problem, too, because um, Joe Biden said that they could be compul uh, they could be made to salute the flag. And that went against the conscience of Jehovah's Witnesses. So the Barnett children were instructed by their father to not salute the flag and to not say the Pledge of Allegiance. I should note in the years between Barnett in Joe Bidas, there is a lot of violent action against Jehovah's Witnesses. People um, were very upset and looked at them as targets for being unpatriotic, for holding up to their beliefs. So I think we want to note that because what these children did was brave. Yeah. There's, no, mean, there's, and, there's no doubt about it, right? It's brave. And Nick's being gentle about the words. Um, yes. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses were dragged out of their house and like pulled through their towns and then put up almost like displays of bad patriots. Yes. And so these these young kids, and they're like what, I wanna say like third, fifth grade and seventh grade? I was gonna say eight and 11, I believe, were their ages, something like that. So yeah, I think that's about right. And they um, have to so go they're, into they're their young. school by themselves and make this decision. And their dad did say like, this is what we believe. Yes. You make your decision. And they were brave enough to go and say, no, this is against my religion. And it, you know, there's amazing stories behind this, but they, I love my country, I love my school, but I cannot do this because yes. of my beliefs. And that's and they, coming and they're from expelled. an 11 year old. Yeah. yeah, and they were expelled and that's how the lawsuit started and that's how it got before the Supreme Court. And so that's an incredible story that's there. That's one of the reasons I like to tell it. And I know that's why Curry likes it too. And what does the Supreme Court do? Well, it reverses itself. Just three years later, they, they've changed their mind. Now, part of that is there's, um, uh, there's a handful of new justices, but part of it is that some justices change their mind. Um, and I think that that's an interesting part of this case. And it's Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson, who writes this opinion. And Robert Jackson essentially says, you cannot use compulsion to get patriotism. He says, 
First off, we know historically that doesn't work. You can look at the Spanish Inquisition. You can look at the Romans persecution of the Christians. You can look so many different places and you can see you can't force people to feel patriotic. That doesn't work um, because it's about consciousness, right? And uh, so you have to change people's minds. You have to convince them, right? And that's an, so that's a relationship. Be, uh, look at freedom as well too, right? So he's, he's making that point, right? And then he says, look, we apply the limitations to the constitution with no fear that freedom to be intellectually and spiritually diverse or even contrary will d disintegrate the social organization. So what he's saying is, look, patriotism should be voluntary and spontaneous. And we have a diverse um, country, right? We have a religiously diverse country. And part of that, um, those ideas of religious liberty and freedom of speech is that, right? Pluralism, as we call it, right? Multiple views. And then I think in uh, two rather famous quotes, uh, Jackson says, one, that the very purpose of a Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, right? That means sort of, you know, the back and forth of politics. Uh, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials and establish them as legal principles applied by the courts, right? The court's job is to protect these key rights, right? That has to be removed from Congress being able to do whatever they want with it. And then he says, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act faith therein, which I think is one of the more amazing um, uh, sentences in a Supreme Court opinion. And it's very powerful. So I think, again, that helps also distill not only religious liberty, but freedom of speech, the whole concept behind the whole First Amendment you get in just a couple pithy sentences. Um, so I, 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 I pithy. yes, <laughs> I, I think it's a good question. And there was a question in the chat and I totally get where you're coming from. But one of the things I wanted to just real quickly, Nick, because we are running out of time is a lot of these religion cases are about religions that aren't mainstream. Yes. Minor aren't what we, yeah, that are like, uh, what's the, is it Santa Seven Maria day one? Adventists in 1960s. That's, who refuses to work on the Sabbath and uh, the Supreme Court ends up siding with her. Yoder and then, is- and It's Amish children and Yoder who and uh, then, the parents want to remove them from high school. And then what's the one with um, peyote? And it, that was Native Americans, I believe. Oh, I thought that, it was uh, a religious. Use, I thought it was a Hawaii, uh, like there, there, a religious. There's that too. There's the, there's the Haitian, um, uh, that that that's true as well. But the one you're thinking of, the peyote, was a Native American spiritual rituals. You're right. Um, so, but yeah. anyways, they're all. You're right. They're all religious minorities, and this really goes back to the very beginning. We like to talk about the 17th century, the arrival of a whole bunch of religious dissidents from England, and that that tradition carries on through the Quakers to the Shakers to the Jehovah's mm -hmm. Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists. The whole point is that um, it's about protecting these minority views because it's part of the right of conscience, right? The ability to decide for oneself, um, that that's so key. And so I think that very idea that is at the core of our protections, our freedoms under the First Amendment is also reflected by these kinds of decisions, right? You can see how it manifests itself. Um, and why it, why it is that these cases come out of there is for that very reason, right? It's not Protestants who are suing, right? It's Jehovah's Witnesses, and I think that that makes sense in some in, in some fashion, right? Because the the whole design is to protect not necessarily the majority belief, but those minority beliefs. And I think that's it, that one of our students kind of like asked a question around that. And I thought it was really important that you can, if you're just studying First Amendment or religion, and we're going to do that, I think next month, next yes, month is I First so. Amendment month. So it will, will kind of pull you through those strings and you can see it. And it is usually small groups or groups that are not well known or understood too. Um, okay. So we have like two more two really big ones to go through, but I really just want to start if we can just get Korematsu in there. Sure. Um, Happy to talk about Korematsu because we're on World War II again. 
Yeah, and everybody, we, this briefing document that you're going to get has way more in it than just these yes. cases. But we wanted to do that so you didn't feel rushed and you have everything you need. And you can always follow up with questions for me and Nick. We're here for you all the time, even on Twitter. Go ahead. Last two minutes. <laughs> bring us home. <laughs> for for Korematsu. Home. Yeah, I mean, so oh, the I'm basic... sorry, I put the wrong one in. Yeah, yeah, no, you're fine. I was waiting for you to, I figured you okay. had a picture, which you probably yeah. do. But Korematsu, that's, so that's Fred Korematsu who was a young Japanese American who sued, there's a picture of him there, um, over uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's executive order 9066, which as essentially created, though the military had to act themselves, the Japanese internment system, the, the camps that were set up um, under the rationale that there were spies amongst us, right? The idea was there are Japanese Americans, some of them are spies who are supplying um, information to uh, the Japanese forces who were currently fighting in World War II. Um, and therefore, there's a public security and national security need um, to keep them separate for this period of time. And so Korematsu is about a challenge by Fred Korematsu to that order, right? So that has to do with presidential power, but also um, uh, Korematsu's rights as an individual, right? Um, he sued under the Fifth Amendment, but we don't need to really go, get into due process too much. It's just to say that he, he's contesting what seems to us to be a very obvious problem now, right? But in the fog of war, the Supreme Court actually went the, uh, upheld the order in a six to three decision. Um, so why did, why did the uh, Supreme Court uphold the, uh, the order? Um, they did so despite using what we call strict scrutiny. We don't really need to get into what that means. So much to say is they gave a heightened, right? The highest amount of scrutiny. In other words, they, it should be the hardest to pass this test, basically. And the government passed the test. Why did the government pass the test? Uh, well, just as Black said, look, it's uh, Korematsu wasn't excluded um, because of hostility to him and her race. It was because we are at war with the Japanese empire and there is military urgency that all citizens of Japanese ancestry be segregated from the West Coast temporarily. And Congress made this determination they have the power to do so. And we aren't gonna question that. Um, but there are three dissenters and each one of them uh, makes points that I'll just say very, very briefly about it. Justice Murphy, um, he's really the first justice to recognize directly the problem of racism in a Supreme Court opinion. He does that more than once in 1944, but here he says, um, this opinion falls into the quote, ugly abyss of racism. And it was a quote, legalization of racism, which bore unfortunate resemblance to the quote, abhorrent and despicable treatment of minority groups by the dictatorial tyrannies, which the, this nation is now pledged to destroy. In other words, he was talking about the Nazis as well, right? Uh, Justice Roberts said that this was a clear violation of constitutional rights because the citizen was being punished um, for not submitting to imprisonment in a concentration camp. He used that word in 1944 uh, uh, based on his ancestry, right? So he said this is clearly about that. And then Justice Jackson said, look, I mean, if military, military orders normally, we shouldn't question them. But the problem here is once the emergency conditions go away, if the court says this is okay, it might never go away, right? In other words, Jackson is saying, think about the possibility that the right of Congress or the government to create temporary camps for different races um, could be possible beyond an emergency would be what he called, quote, a loaded weapon ready for the hands of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Every repetition embeds that principle more deeply in our law and thinking expands it to new purposes, right? Um, so again, there's Justice Jackson with power, uh, but saying, look, if you can say it's an emergency, you can say it's temporary, but once you do it, can you take it away, right? And um, I think it's worth knowing that uh, Korematsu himself, nearly four decades later, got his case, his conviction overturned, which is an incredible thing, by the way, <laughs> to be able to have done that, but he did that. Uh, eventually, Congress in 1988 actually gave reparations to the victims of the internment camps. 
And uh, recently, the Supreme Court essentially disavowed the case. They didn't explicitly overrule it, but they uh, suggested that it was overruled in the uh, in history, essentially, right? That history itself had overruled the case, and therefore it was no longer good law to be referred to. Awesome. I think that is a great way to kind of wrap up even the court can fix its own mistakes and right the wrongs of the past when the people fight it and when the people bring it to them. So I, I think Korematsu is a great American that we can all look to um, hold on to and say what a uh, tragic but amazing story in the long run. So thank you so much, Nick. There was a lot of cases we went through today. So again, we'll send you the briefing document. We have the PowerPoint, they're all on our website. We loved looking at um, one of our partners which the Federal Judicial Center, it's a, the Judicial Learning Center. So I put that in the chat as well, and we'll send that out to you on Friday with the wrap up the classes in review. But without further ado, we're gonna wrap up class. Have a great day, everybody. And Nick, thanks so much.